It's a truncated piece about teenagers driving around in Morgan Hill. It's called Roadkill. First, it was the bird. It was quicker to take the back roads, avoiding the traffic on 101 altogether. Allison could reach considerable speeds before having to break at stop signs, slowing down just enough to lean forward in her seat and check for approaching vehicles before speeding up again. Small flocks of birds burst from irrigation ditches along the sides of the road, disturbed by her passing. Morning fog hung heavy at the base of the foothills, creeping steadily upward and turning the road slick. The little birds shot out and up from the tall grass, moved and flashed together like the schools of fish she'd seen at the aquarium. At lunch, she walked to the parking lot where her friends were gathered around her car, laughing. A constriction in her throat, a warm welling in her stomach, excited to be part of the joke. There's a bird stuck to your bumper, shouted the chorus of voices. Everyone was bending over, holding their hair back and inspecting the front of her car, or slapping shoulders and pushing forward. It's stuck, shouted Kristen, grabbing Allison's wrist to bring her to the front of the car. It's dead, shouted Andy. I killed a bird, asked Allison, locking her knees. Is it bad? You've got to look at it. Kristen was still pulling at her wrist. Allison knew that the bird must be glued to the front of her bumper with blood and gore and maybe the moisture from the fog and definitely the fact that she had been going 70 in a 45 zone. No, said Allison, wrenching her wrist from Kristen's grasp. No, I don't need to see it. On the drive home, she was slow. She cringed at the little white feathers that bounced their way up her windshield. She could see them caught and dancing in her wake through the rearview mirror. She looked for the disgusted expressions of drivers coming toward her, but it was hard to tell. She turned on her windshield wipers. Once home, she edged the car a little past the asphalt, positioning the front of it onto the grass bordering the hibernating grapevines. The ground was littered with branches and twigs from the eucalyptus trees, and she selected one that looked long enough, strong enough to pry a dead bird from her, front co from her car. She moved toward the front, and there it was, it was perfect. A tiny brown sparrow with, with its wings fully extended above its little body as if it were still in flight. No blood, no gore, no nothing. She bent over, got close. She could see the individual feathers themselves, the whites and browns and grays. One of the bird's fragile legs was wedged into the small gap where the hood met the rest of the car. Its feet were curved delicately backwards. Allison opened her car door and fumbled for the latch that would open the hood. There was a popping sound as it released, and she sat back in the seat. Her cat Charlie trotted past, the bird in his mouth. What was she going to do with it anyway? Then it was the squirrel. The same thing, a hurried drive to school against the foothills in the winter morning dark. Her friends gathered around her car at lunch. She again refused to look at it on campus, convinced the only reason the animal was adhering to the front of her car was something she didn't want to look at in the presence of other people. Again, the squirrel was intact, tail woven around the grill. She found another eucalyptus branch to pry the animal loose, and it fell on the grass, looking thoroughly unhurt, aside from the fact that it was most decidedly dead. Allison looked around for Charlie, and he bounced over to sniff at the squirrel before picking it up by the scruff of its neck and wandering away to the bushes. Then, it was the wild boar. Of course, Charlie wouldn't be able to take the wild boar away, so she drove up the hill to the dam. She'd heard reports of mountain lions up there, and vultures were always circling. The boar had been hit mid-run, its legs, its legs extended and its belly hanging low. It had mean-looking tusks that had gotten wedged on one side of the bumper, and powerful legs with pointed gray hooves that were hooked on the other. She didn't want to, but there were only twigs on the ground, and so she took her field hockey stick from its bag in her trunk and used it as a crowbar. The wild boar lay at the edge of the gravel and the grass, round and solid and still. Then there was the skunk, the coyote, the bobcat, the deer, even a red-tailed hawk. 
She was working her way through the native species. She wondered if soon she'd find lemurs and wallabies adhered to the front of her car, if soon there'd be the brightly colored feathers of parrots whipping up over her windshield, or water from some tropical fish that had plastered themselves to her Toyota. She stopped parking in the lot where the crowds gathered easily. Instead, she parked her car farther and farther away from the school, on the side of the road near the walnut orchards. She'd walk at least 15 minutes to class, and people would ask her what she'd killed that day. <laughs> she deposited the bodies all over the place, sometimes in fields on unpopulated roads, sometimes at the entrances to state and county parks, as close to not pavement as she could get. She tried not to use a location twice, afraid that the last animal might still be there. She'd heard nothing on the news about a slew of dead animals that refused to decompose, but she didn't want to risk it. The end. Thank you. Jenny Alton from SFSU.